Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our virtual chat uh, today. Uh, we're pleased to be able to connect with you uh, virtually during this activity of this CVR 2020. Uh, we're going to bring you our thoughts on computer vision. We're going to talk about the history. We're going to talk about the current state and uh, somewhat about where it's headed next. So this video is pre-recorded, so we're not going to take any questions live. Uh, however, I encourage you to visit our CVR page on Amazon.Science and to reach out to our recruiting team to connect with us about opportunities at uh, Amazon. As I mentioned, this discussion is inspired by our focus on CVPR, which is held this week uh, virtually due to our travel restriction and health concerns stemming from the COVID-19 pandemic. Our thoughts are with all those that are affected, and we hope that everybody watching is staying safe. Uh, with that, I'm pleased to welcome my colleagues, and Professor Larry Davis, Professor Pietro Perona, two leaders in the field of computer vision research, who are going to be joining me for what hopefully is going to be an informative and inspiring discussion, especially for students who are considering a career related to computer vision. So uh, let's take a few minutes, introduce ourselves. Let's start with uh, Larry. All right, thanks, Gerard. Right, so I've been with Amazon since uh, late 2018. I joined really right after Thanksgiving. Uh, and I'm in a group called Softlines. That's the organization in Amazon that sells clothing online. So since I've arrived, Soft has been, Softlines has been building up a large science organization uh, in collaboration with other groups in Amazon around the world. So we have scientists in Europe, it's Germany, Spain, the UK, India, Israel, and Australia working on problems related to clothing, right? So the sun never sets on soft line science. Our goal is to help customers find clothing that fits their styles, their shapes, and their budget, and to make shopping more of a fun experience. In fact, later, I'll talk in detail about one of the projects, which is described in our CVPR paper, that we worked on to try and help customers shop for clothing. Before joining Amazon, I was at the University of Maryland in the computer science department. I was a faculty member there. In fact, I still, still am for about 40 years. I'm currently on leap in that position. Maryland has a large and vibrant computer vision laboratory. In fact, the lab celebrated its 50th anniversary just a few years ago. Uh, and one of the areas I worked on with a couple of my remarkable students the past several years was fashion image analysis. And I came to Amazon to translate some of that academic research into products that help customers shop. Great. Thank you, Larry. So uh, I'm Gerard Medioni. I'm a Vice President and Distinguished Scientist. Uh, I came to Amazon in two, June 2014. Uh, and my role is pretty much to uh, uh, drive the tech that goes into our Amazon Go and Just Work Out technology. Uh, so what did I come to, uh, to Amazon? Well, I was a very happy professor at the uh, University of Southern California in LA. Uh, where I spent my entire career, 40 years. Uh, I'm still, I'm, I'm now an emeritus professor. But I went from student to professor to chair of the CS department. Uh, I was teaching AI, computer vision. I was conducting research with my PhD student. Uh, coming to Amazon to work on Amazon Go and just walk out technology was this very unique opportunity to put in practice everything that I've been teaching and publishing throughout my career. Uh, making computer vision work in a retail environment to create this shopping experience where a customer can just walk in into an Amazon Go store, grab what they want, and just walk out. No lines, no checkout. Well, that was an opportunity that was very hard to resist. A, a big part of the team that has helped bring Amazon, the customer obsession to life, and create that experience that customer actually love is a wonderful reward. Wonderful reward. Pietro? Pietro? Hi, Gerard, and hi, Larry, and hello, everyone who's listening to us. <clears throat> I would love to be there in person, but of course, we cannot. Um, so my story is uh, similar. Uh, I've been a professor at Caltech for about 30 
years right now, always working in computer vision. And um, you, you must know, I mean, it's difficult to believe now that uh, until five years ago, not much worked in computer vision. So we were full of ideas, most uh, brilliant ideas, and uh, but none would work very well. And um, you know, in my thesis, I worked on edge detection, which is a field that nowadays is not uh, almost not existent. And uh, I always hoped that we would be able to reproduce the ability of the human visual system one day, and uh, in machines. Uh, but the hope remained the hope for a long time. And now, in the last five years, things have started to work. And um, as any engineer, I take enormous pride in seeing that my field can contribute to society, to industry, to entertainment. <clears throat> and so, like many people, like Gerard and like uh, Larry, I felt a little bit of an itch to be out there and see the ideas that we come up with in uh, academia uh, become reality in services and products that people can use. So in my case, uh, I have been working for about 20 years now on visual categorization. And part of that work has been collecting and annotating large uh, data sets that can be used for uh, training uh, machine vision uh, systems. Uh, and I thought that some of the ideas we developed for, uh, for crowdsourcing annotations could now, were ready for prime time, ready to be used by other people in the field, in computer vision and in industry. And um, and I joined Amazon Web Services to see if I could help um, make that happen. Now, you must know, and in fact, you know that uh, Amazon put out a funky little thing, which is called Amazon Mechanical Turk in uh, uh, about 2005, 2006. And people in computer vision noticed that right away and used it immediately to scale up tremendously the capability of annotating large image data sets. And that's what <clears throat> enabled us to put together a few data collections like uh, Caltech 101 initially, and then eventually ImageNet by Feifei, which triggered the, the deep network revolution. So really, Amazon is one of the key contributors to the current um, wave of, uh, of AI through Amazon Mechanical Turk. And, um, uh, and so when I came into Amazon, I was extremely impressed and I wanted to help make it even better. And so now we have a new service called Ground Truth, of which I was the, uh, the chief scientist that helps people do it. So even professors like me now can, uh, can annotate large data sets. And I don't have to implore my students to help me out uh, for doing that. So I'm very proud of that. I've, I've uh, democratized um, crowdsourcing to the point that professors can use it. Anyway, so that's what I do. Um, and I'm in general involved in putting AI in the cloud at Amazon Web Services. So I think of um, ideas that can be put out for uh, services for computer vision. Um, I also help with uh, with speech and text right now. Um, and so hopefully all of you can try out things because they're out in the cloud and <clears throat> they can be used. Back okay. to Gerard. Thank you, Pietro. Okay, so great. So, uh, so let's kick this uh, kick off this discussion by starting with the origin of computer vision research. So, uh, Pietro, I think computer vision can be traced back to this uh, famous MIT summer project in the mid '60s, and in particular, uh, we can look at Larry Roberts' MIT PhD thesis, which was called at the time "Machine Perception in Three Dimensional Solids." Uh, mm -hmm. But in fact, this fascination with images, for image formation, image interpretation goes way back. So, Pietro, ca can you talk about this earlier works and relation to other fields such as uh, biology, for example? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, First of all, <clears throat> uh, anyone can download uh, Robert's thesis, 1963. And so I would encourage all the students here to download uh, this old, old piece of uh, relic, if you will, uh, and see how people viewed computer vision at the time. It's very interesting. And so, as uh, Gerard says, you know, humans have been aware that uh, we see for the longest time, like, you know, we, we can go blind if we damage our eyes, it's clear. And <clears throat> however, the question of, so there are two key questions that people weren't really thinking about for a long time. One is, realizing that um, vision is a complex pro uh, process. So the image forms on the back of our eye and we have 
little pixel-like structures, photoreceptors, and so our input is a matrix of numbers which doesn't contain any explicit information about what we see. And so there must be some amazing process to convert this matrix of numbers into, into meaning, into information about the world out there. And the second one is that this piece of information, the image, is um, not terribly informative. There is a lot of uh, information that we don't have access to, and there is a lot of ambiguity. So I think that people became aware of this uh, in beginning of being aware of this in the Renaissance when painters discovered uh, perspective uh, because they started thinking that instead of representing images as concepts, they wanted to represent the real world out there. And so this is the beginning of humanism. And so people are not interested any longer in, in concepts of divinity and uh, dreams and miracles they're interested in seeing what is really out there <clears throat> and painters were scientists at the time and so you have a, a number of painters in the renaissance who developed the idea of, of perspective and knew how to project this real world in 3d onto a 2d canvas um, and uh, and so that uh, made people realize of all the ins and outs of image formation and uh, it allowed then people to start thinking about how can you invert that process you know how can you go from an image back out to the world that uh, generated it and that's exactly what vision is all about and so at the beginning of the 1900s there was a practical problem which was photogrammetry how do you reconstruct terrain from pictures taken by airplanes and people did it by hand but there was this concept that computation is involved and you need to understand geometry and so that's somehow the beginning of computational vision as opposed to computer vision. So the computation was done by a human, uh, but uh, the idea was you need to understand well the geometry and the physics of image formation in order to be able to invert this process. And people developed equations to be able to invert uh, perspective whenever and, and start to understand when you can do it. Then uh, in the middle of the 1900s, psychology started becoming really interested. There is also earlier work, but the, you know, 1900s, what are all the processes that uh, the brain might be using? And people realized that there were all of these visual illusions, which are not mistakes of the visual system. They're just wrong assumptions, if you will, that the visual system makes in inverting this, uh, this map. And uh, physiology started in the 1960s, a physiology of the visual system. And people started measuring how neurons code for different properties of the image. And so they realized that neurons in the early visual system code for very simple properties like edges and uh, textures and stereoscopic disparity. And that gave a lot of inspiration to computer vision people. And so what is computer vision? It's the idea that you can build machines that can reproduce these computational processes in order to automatically extract meaning or information about the world from images. And so that's where Robert's thesis comes. And so he had to invent the idea of, say, uh, extracting edges because he realized that lines, the line drawing of a solid object is very informative and then how do you use that in order to reconstruct vision and so that's how, somehow how computational or computer vision started from a long tradition of computational vision, from psychology, from uh, physiology and then uh, the, the advent of computers and the hardware with which we can capture cheaply and expensively images and so that's how we all started about uh, about 60 years ago. All right, thank you. Uh, so, Larry, uh, this groundbreaker they, they really laid out the foundation of computer vision uh, from uh, from psychology and from uh, physiology, but also we can trace computer vision to a field that at the time we called the picture processing. Can you uh, say a few words about that? Sure thing. <clears throat> so. In addition to being a faculty member at the University of Maryland, I was also a graduate of the University of Maryland. Uh, and in 1972, I joined the picture processing lab at Maryland to work with my advisor, a guy named Azriel Rosenfeld, who is generally regarded as the founder of the field of what we call today compu computer vision. Right. So Azriel wrote the first textbook in the mid 1960s. He started the first journal uh, and also the first conference, as well as establishing ICCV in 1987. So Azriel was one of two or three real geniuses that I knew in my lifetime. 
uh, having completed both his PhD in mathematics and rabbinical degree in his early 20s. And he had broad interests in not only mathematics and computer science, but also psychology and neurophysiology. So the first day I show up at work uh, to work with this guy, and he just gives me a stack of papers and tells me to go away and read them from top to bottom. All right. And at the top of the stack, was one of the most famous papers in the history of science. It's a paper entitled, What the Frog's Eye Tells the Frog's Brain, all right? And this paper made what at the time was a revolutionary claim that vision systems were based on extracting ecological features from what the eye records. So if you're a frog, right, this, these are moving blobs indicating prey and predator, okay? Rather than simply mapping the input image somehow onto the brain. Uh, and there were all kinds of theories about the early part of the vision system doing some kind of complicated local Fourier transform just to get a copy of the image into the brain that the brain could analyze. Right. Well, further down the stack were papers by Yuval and Wiesel, their famous papers on single cell recordings from cells from cats and monkeys that Pietro referred to a little bit earlier. These were the basis for the Nobel Prize and a collection of older papers on neural models and cellular automata like Minsky's Perceptron book, which is another must read uh, for every young student. Uh, our research at the time in the lab was really more practical, right? We were looking at problems that uh, were at the core of early industrial vision systems. This included how to segment objects from images from their backgrounds, how to represent their shapes or their textures, and to identify defects between observations and models for the objects you were looking at. And in, for, and in fact, the work done in our lab formed the basis for a generation uh, of industrial vision systems. Of course, compared to what we can do today with computer vision, it was all very primitive. Uh, as Pietro says, nobody works on edge detection anymore, right? A lot of the problems we worked on have disappeared. We had lots of industrial collaborators and that experience may be interested in research that enabled applications of that interest that lasted through my entire career. And as I said, one of the principal reasons that I left academia and joined Amazon is because there's really no better company in the world to work on app, real applications of computer vision that are gonna have enormous impact from fashion to video and music and onto physical stores like Gerard's Go. I should say one of my heroes early in my career as a professor was Berthold Horn from MIT. Horn was one of the clearest and deepest thinkers in the history of the field. And his research actually opened subfields, right? video processing and physics-based vision. So I'll close this segment by saying that another paper that every student should read is Horn's paper on optical flow, right? It, it reads like a modern paper. It's a beautiful work of art and science. Uh, it's interesting also that one of Horn's, Horn's earliest papers was with Tom Binford, who's, who went to Stanford, who Pietro, uh, actually Pietro didn't talk about Tom Binford, so I will. Uh, Tom was one of the, also the early pioneers in computer vision, uh, working on some of the earliest 3D vision uh, uh, projects. But uh, the paper with Horn was about edge detection, right? You might want to read that for Binford historical is my, <clears throat> Binford is my academic grandfather. So his, uh, my advisor is Jitendra and his uh, advisor is Binford. Yeah. Right, right. Good bloodlines. Very nice. Thank you. Well, Binford is also my grandfather, since my advisor was uh, Ram Nevatya, who was a well, student I'm, of I'm, Binford. So we I'm share, so we have a common grandfather here. Uh, yeah. yeah, my my grandfather is some obscure group theoretician at Columbia who uh, I don't know his name. <clears throat> <laughs> uh, I see wanted to know that, uh, by the way, this uh, foundational and important research was not just done in the US. Uh, I mean, there were uh, several others that have made a valuable contribution. Uh, for example, in Europe, uh, Jan Kondering uh, and Olivier Forgeras made a significant contribution. So, um, okay, so Larry, you, you pointed out that a computer vision is really hard. Uh, I mean, we have been working on this for more than 50 years and we're not even close to the capability of the human visual system. So uh, why not? I guess we're not as smart as we thought we were, all right? Uh, I mean, this shouldn't really be a surprise. I mean, after all, a very large part of our brains <clears throat> is, is devoted to seeing, right? Even though it seems to us like some kind of effortless process uh, and generally doesn't require any concentration except for some visual search problems. But remember, in the early days of AI, people thought vision would be solved uh, before complex games like chess and go. And, and we all know that isn't the way it played out. I mean, there's the famous summer vision project uh, at MIT, uh, 
you know, I think Jerry Sussman, who was an undergraduate at the time, was given the subtask of working on color constancy. He was going to knock it off in four weeks. All right. Uh, you know, the problem really never got solved. Sussman's a full professor at MIT who never worked on computer vision again, right, moved on to fields where there were problems he can solve. So uh, it's always been hard, right? There's, there's lots of reasons uh, <clears throat> that every student knows about the loss of information and going from 2D to 3D, complex imaging conditions like reflections, transparency, atmospherics, uh, and, you know, large variability in the appearance of, of everyday things. Uh, I think one of the really hard and outstanding challenges to computer vision, one of the biggest challenges is to, to achieve human level vision, uh, is the interaction of knowledge and common sense with computer vision. Uh, I worked uh, on this problem throughout my career, uh, looking at various ways of integrating uh, uh, different types of probabilistic logics with vision for even simple applications like activity detection in sports video. Right there, we use rules of the game, not always followed to the letter of the law by the players, to provide a set of external constraints on how athletes interact with each other in the field and the ball and how the game's developed, right? And so we built these soft logical models with this knowledge that controlled various vision modules to overcome deficiencies in observation. Right. Under, learning how to integrate common sense reasoning into deep learning systems, a major challenge. I, mean, I don't think really anybody knows how to do this yet. It's a, a really large outstanding problem. It's a very challenging area to work in, but one with just exceptional potential rewards. Okay. Pietro, you want to add something to this? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So I think, uh, Larry, you are right on target. Uh, and so what, what I can add is also that we are always hungry, right? So vision is this wonderful sensor, which is non-contact. It's very rich. And um, it allows, it's, it's passive, so we don't even need to project out uh, energy in order to, to sense the world. And it allows us to discover so much. And you know, what are the limits to what can we find out about the world? We don't know. There are so many things that we want to know about. And um, so apart from this intrinsic ambiguity of images, but then there are you know, uh, so many things. Like I look at your face right now. It's not that I see the head of Larry Davis. I see Larry Davis. And I can, I can guess how your whole posture is. Even if I only see your, your head and your shoulders, I can imagine your <clears throat> imagine your emotions in this moment we, we have this bond with this connection and so there are so many things we can do with vision and so we will always be hungry and um, it's difficult to see a point where we will stop discovering new things we can do with this wonderful sensor thank you thank you all right so let, let's switch topic a bit here uh, as you probably are aware i'm the general chair of this year's cvpr conference uh, CVPR started in uh, 1983 with just a few people, and there has been exponential growth year after year because of the way the field has grown. So uh, I want to talk a bit, not about just the application for computer vision that exists today, but uh, what makes the field uh, so exciting. Uh, so both of you, you, you actually wrote paper that are going to be presented uh, at this conference. So let's start there. Uh, let's start with Larry. So Larry, you have a paper on fashion outfit complementary item retrieval. Uh, can you talk about this work and uh, how you are approaching the application of computer vision for help in shopping for clothes online? Sure thing. All right. So the, the, the customer problem that we're trying to address in this paper is that a lot of times you see an item for sale in the Amazon catalog. Uh, but uh, people don't know how to wear it, okay? This doesn't apply so much to those of us attending conferences in person. We all wear jeans and conference t-shirts, but for a lot of people shopping online, right, they want to uh, wear a certain style. They want to understand how things go together, right? So you see something stylish, what will it go with? So the idea is to look at fashion compatibility, right? This is based on an item's pattern, material, texture, shape, color, a whole set of variables to show customers how to wear an item and what to pair it with. But an important challenge is that for different pairs of product types, the product dimensions that determine stylistic compatibility will vary. So technically what we do is we learn style sub subspaces to model these pairwise product type compatibilities. And most important, develop a scalable approach to building outfits that can be applied to a catalog as vast as Amazon's. Right? That is, the model is, able, is actually able to produce 
in style consistent embeddings that can be used for retrieval. So we can retrieve compatible items rather than just being able to rank pairs of items with respect to compatibility. And this is the trick to having a scalable solution, right? So when this technology is embedded in an Amazon product, customers will have more confidence by knowing how to wear any item they're interested in or what and what else would go with it. And given what's occurring with the COVID-19 pandemic, this work might even be more significant because customers might want to do more of their shopping online. All right. Thank you. And Pietro, you, you wrote a paper uh, on zero-shot video classification. Uh, so, so can you tell us more about how you took this problem of uh, expensive video data annotation and propose a radically new approach using this zero-shot learning? Yeah, so first of all, this is the work of, uh, of Biagio Brattoli, who is a brilliant uh, PhD student in Germany who spent a summer with us in 2019. And uh, this is the time to mention it, so we have this uh, beautiful summer intern program uh, at Amazon. We get amazing PhD students who work with us. It's a joy for us to be able to, um, to work with these students, and it's a moment where we can uh, take intellectual risks. So we're not developing a product, we're just taking a stab in the dark, trying something difficult. And the students get a lot of first-hand exposure to the tools we use, and also to the mentality of how you develop a product in industry. So they get to, to understand how uh, companies work, and, and uh, that's you know very useful. It's an eye-opener for many students. And in any case, going back to the question, um, so there is this problem of zero-shot learning. So what is it? Um, we know wait, that wait, is Biagio is Biagio coming to Amazon afterwards? Is he? Yes, yes. Is he going to be joining? Will join us uh, soon. I, oh, uh, very nice. Few weeks. Um, yeah. So, um, so what's the problem with zero-shot learning? So we we know we want to um, one of the things that our visual system does effortlessly is categorizing things. So all of us can talk about dogs. We talk about trees and cell phones and so on. And, um, and we can recognize a dog even if it belongs to a breed we have never seen before. And so when a new object comes along, we are never uh, at a loss for what might it be, or we're very rarely at a loss. We can tell which category it is, and that helps us a lot because we know how to respond uh, to that object, how to make use of it, what the properties might be. Now, we know that one of the places where uh, computer vision and machine learning in general have not become as good as humans is the efficiency of learning. In order to train a system that recognizes birds, for example, we know that we need about a thousand pictures for each species in order to be able to train the system. That's very expensive. And sometimes simply we don't have enough uh, pictures of a certain species. So the question is, can we do like the human visual system and be prepared to recognize or learn a new category from having seen similar categories or related ones before and therefore, can we be ready to learn a new one? And so if you take a birder to uh, Papua New Guinea, they've never been there, you show them three or four pictures of a given bird, a bird of paradise, whatever, they learn it immediately, while our machines are much uh, dumber than that. And so what Biagio was looking at is, can we prepare uh, a machine to learn from video actions uh, and activities, which are a very useful thing to, to recognize, and can we do so with zero prior training examples? And so, of course, I will not tell you how it goes because you've got to read the paper, but uh, that was a problem. And uh, there is a very simple and elegant solution that uh, Biagio used, and it's way, way better than what was there before. So that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, so we have looked at the history. We have uh, looked at a couple, we have talked about a couple of papers that are appearing here. Let's look uh, a little further out and uh, ask the question, what do you think the biggest opportunities uh, for computer vision are, given uh, the progress of the field and what we know today? Larry? All right, this is the question I hate the most, right? This is a hard question to answer. <clears throat> but I'd like to try and give an answer that maybe you couldn't have given 10 years ago. Right, so everybody's known forever that if the computer vision problem could be solved, then it would enable endless applications in many areas. Uh, in fact, this is the main reason the field receives substantial and continuous funding in the United States, even though progress until recently was, let's say, painfully slow. 
all right? With some notable exceptions like uh, 3D shape recovery, SLAM, things of that sort, all right? So one area that I think is high potential growth is content creation. In fact, there's a very interesting workshop on this topic at CVPR. And of course, this is largely being enabled by the remarkable recent progress on GAN. So this is an explosive growth area that would have been hard to predict 10 years ago because you needed a technological breakthrough. Another is, is sight and sound. I think this is really exciting, right? <clears throat> For decades, researchers tried to get robots to see, but they never listened to anything. They didn't hear anything. Acoustic scene analysis is very challenging, and it's actually fun to argue about whether vision or sound is harder, right? Uh, they're both hard, but for different reasons. The recent work we've seen in the field on sound source separation is very compelling. In fact, it's borderline astounding. Uh, and work like uh, the work being done in Alba's group at MIT on sound and vision should inspire uh, more students to work on these problems. If you want an historical reference, there was a psychologist, his name was Bregman, and he wrote an interesting book on acoustic scene analysis uh, in the 70s that you can dig into and uh, uh, take a look at uh, uh, what was known about the subject back then, but it's very hard, all right? <clears throat> uh, and then I'll end with a, a suggestion, which is probably wrong, all right? A long shot proposal, and that's uh, documents, right? Uh, I don't just mean getting vision systems to be able to read and organize or summarize 2020 style documents, which is an important problem, but actually rethinking uh, what documents are in the context of uh, computer vision and modern AI, right? just changing the way we communicate. Uh, I think that computer vision is going to play a large role there. Interesting. That's uh, thought provoking and that's different. Absolutely. Uh, Pietro, you have uh, other perspective on, uh, on this as well? Yeah, yeah, of course. It sounds to, to me, it sounded like Larry doesn't really hate the question. He, he loves it, and uh, he got <laughs> into it really nicely. Um, and by the way, if people are interested in document, there is a wonderful team uh, at uh, Amazon Web Services that has a, a system out called Textract. And of course, um, I'm not going to talk about what they're going to do in the future, but uh, the present is already quite interesting. Um, yeah, so. Just to mention another couple of ideas. Um, so one that I'm quite keen to, to see develop is the understanding of causality. And um, we've been now almost uh, po uh, poisoned or gotten addicted by the idea of learning. And with learning, we learn correlations between things. And that's really good for predicting. But as we develop machines that go out in the world, like autonomous driving cars and robots, that interact with people, we need to understand cause and effect relationships. Because if you want to affect the world, you need to understand what causes what. And, uh, and that's very um, uh, primitive in computer vision. In fact, most computer vision researchers don't understand the difference between cause and uh, causality and correlation. And so we need to put in some effort there so that we enable machines to, to understand cause and effect. And by the way, humans are also pretty bad at understanding cause and effect so the, the idea would be to do better than than the average human at that and you can think of machines that understand cause and effect would be really useful in science so think of how many biology experiments you could carry out and uh, and um, how much you could understand about the world so that's one the second one that really fascinates me is um is connecting um uh, or developing machines that help us put together knowledge and so what I observe is that visual knowledge, but knowledge in general, is very distributed amongst humans. So if you think of a birder that goes out and recognizes birds of California, but you take them to Australia and they don't know what they're looking at, or a radiologist may be really good with bone cancer, but you show them radi radiographs of liver and they're not super good. They have to ask their colleague to help them out, right? So any community has a lot of knowledge, but the knowledge is distributed amongst the people. And it's there in data <clears throat> and machines can learn from each one of the components of a community and so i i feel that we are slowly flipping the tables on on the problem of machine learning so it used to be that the machine is sitting there it's like a tool and we are like an oracle we give a machine some knowledge a machine has to learn it and now we have more and more machines that face a community where knowledge is distributed and it's the machine who has to figure out who knows what and ask people the right questions to be able to um, to instruct itself. And through Amazon Mechanical Turk, we have this uh, developed this ability now 
to um, we have methods, statistical methods to understand who knows what and which annotators are giving us the right knowledge and which ones are not. So we're making progress there. And some of my students have been working with the California Academy of Science um, to build an app called iNaturalist, which you can use to recognize plants and animals. In fact, I would encourage everyone to download it to their smart devices. And this app is, um, so there is a system uh, in a server that is learning all the time from what, what uh, labels people give to the different animals and plants. And there are some people who are experts and the machine knows who are the experts and it pays attention to what they say. And, um, and it doesn't pay attention to people like me who don't know anything. Uh, and it trains itself by, by uh, interacting with the community. And so we're up now to 50 or 60,000 species of plants and animals that the machine has learned from people. And the goal is half a million. So one somewhat um, ambitious uh, idea I have is that maybe uh, our field can help humanity uh, uh, organize all of its knowledge in a way that is very active so that the machine knows who knows what, it knows how to put you in touch with the expert, it can answer many questions by itself, it can tell you which data are relevant and which parts of knowledge are ambiguous and need to be uh, understood better. So that's another place where I think uh, computer vision can do a lot. Very nice. Thank you. Thank and, you. By the way, this yeah, is a project I run with, uh, with uh, Serge Belange, it's called Visipedia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Very nice. I mean, there are many, of course, other applications of computer vision that have existed for, for a long time. Uh, you know, cultural heritage, preservation of cultural heritage is, a, is one such uh, uh, example. Uh, okay, well, thank you both. I mean, that kind of brings us to the, uh, the end of this uh, virtual discussion. Uh, I want to thank everyone for tuning in uh, into this event and to the two of you, my co-panelists, uh, Professor Larry Davis, uh, Professor Pietro Perona. Uh, if you're interested to learn more about the uh, Amazon Computer Vision Initiative, as well as other AI ML work, uh, I strongly encourage you to visit uh, the website at amazon.science. Uh, if you click on the virtual sponsor page uh, on the website, uh, it will take you to amazon.science. Uh, and we look forward to connecting with you during and after this very unusual and unique CVPR conference. Thank you.